Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm your host, PJ Weary, and I'm here today with Dr. Lewis Gordon. Uh, he is the professor and department head of philosophy, uh, the philosophy department in Yukon. And he is the editor of the American Philosophical Association blog series, Black Issues in Philosophy with Jane Anna Gordon, and the book series, Global Critical Caribbean Thought, and also, uh, also Jan uh, Jane Anna Gordon, the journal Philosophy and Global Affairs. Uh, he specializes in Africana philosophy, existentialism, phenomenology, philosophy of science, um, race, racism, philosophy of culture. Uh, Dr. Lewis Gordon, I mean, there's probably 10, 12 more topics, you know, um, broad range. So happy to have you on here today and uh, want to discuss with you. You did a talk in Brazil on uh, decolonizing black aesthetics. And uh, just want to say, one, thank you for having you on here. And two, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you became interested in these various topics. Well, sure. Well, to begin with, delighted to be here. And even though there are a lot of areas in which I specialize, they all connect over, uh, they all connect around a very simple set of questions that are really difficult to answer. And, <laughs> And and, yeah. and and the two basic questions are, what is the human being's relationship to reality? Mm. And what do we do about the many unfortunate ways we have of evading it? So I do a lot on human evasion of reality. And so as, as you could imagine, it's not only in trying to develop our relationship to reality, why we develop philosophy, sciences, etc., but it's also in our effort to evade it that we have developed all kinds of pernicious things ranging from racism to sexism mm. to colonialism. But, there's an, but there is more because, unfortunately, we also use the sciences and philosophy to evade reality. And the very fact that philosophy, science, and many other areas of research were rallied in the forces of human evasion leads to a crisis for them. Because the question mm. at that point is, are they still justifiable? And in my work, I talk about the problem of justification mm. in need of justification. So you could see that, that little meta twist there. But in, yeah. but in terms of me, of, of, of who I am, that, you know, it's a very funny thing. Um, the way I do philosophy, and not just philosophy, many other areas of thought, really connect through to what I just said. Because part of mm -hmm. the arrogance and the problem of the sciences and of philosophy is the presupposition that other modes of addressing reality somehow do so in an inferior way. And this is part of a more pernicious colonial view of knowledge. Whereas if you notice in my writings or even in my lectures, varieties of resources including other disciplines and other modes of expression come to the fore, not as ancillary, not as garnish, <laughs> not as, you know what I mean, uh, decoration, but as central parts of argumentation. So, and this is connected to uh, a realization that goes all the way back to childhood in that reality is just always greater than we are. But the other thing about mm. but the other thing about reality is well, reality is also wondrous. Often when I'm asked to talk about who I am and what brought me to this, I never at all thought about becoming a philosopher. I was born in the island of Jamaica, and I was born and you know life has a weird way of making everything symbolic. I was born the year of Jamaica's legal independence, 1962. I was born in May and the island was legally independent in August. And uh, in the interim, it's funny how things go full circle, because I was a child who, um, at birth, uh, the pediatricians informed my mother that I would not live for longer than two weeks because I had many disabilities. So my mm. grandmother came down and expected to be at a baby's funeral. A week goes by, two weeks, and then three months. And by three months, I started speaking. And so my mother said, yeah, but it, it sounds like it's, it's all unusual. But the thing I've subsequently learned is that 
many children, if they're brought home to um, households with a lot of women in them or a lot of girls, tend to acquire speech early. I've met many people who had the same story of speaking well before the age of one, and they all have the same story. Uh, they were they were in a environment where the moment one woman or a girl puts down the child, another one picks the child up, and they start playing and talking with the child, and this is enter entry into the world of speech. So, one of the things from that brush or struggle with death is yeah. that um, it. And acquiring speech so early, it meant that I was processing a lot that was around me. And rea- the yeah. world just seemed so vibrant, so extraordinary. And I remembered, I remember, so I, my memories go back to three months because of language acquisition. But I, rem- mm. I remember very distinctly when I was two years old, and we were visiting, at this point, my grandmother had returned to Jamaica and was... Uh, my maternal grandmother was living in an area of Jamaica that was very dark. Uh, And and it's because, you know, back in the 60s, the islands, and if you're in Kingston in the main city, you have streetlights. But if you go out into areas by the mountains, it's much darker. And I remember very distinctly when my uncles and I were walking there, we went through a football field, which is the Caribbean way of what Americans call soccer. And because all the lights were off in the all the lights were off in the football field, and it's this open field. Imagine just looking up at the stars without light pollution. It is so amazing, so absolutely amazing that I was caught in wonder. And from that point on, it really struck me how it just extraordinary it is that we have the capacity to realize that, to see that. Just, I could even remember right now the way the air smelled while I was looking up at the sky. Now, I say this because subsequently, the many things, becoming an immigrant to the United States at the age of nine, living in the Bronx, initial encounters with everything from racism to the violence. Oh, this is a very violent country. Mm. Uh, attitudes mm. that are antisocial. You know, we live in a country, for instance, that unfortunately uh, values property over people. Uh, we, with this absurdity of privatized health care leads to a situation where there are people just dying in droves or getting inferior service, all for the sake, not simply of profit, but that's also connected to the country's racism. Because historically, the people who have less access to the private are the people who are black or brown. And so a lot of policies are designed to maintain forms of exclusion. And these attitudes continue in the double standards, even in school systems. I was speaking with a woman the other day who was a physicist, and she and I were just relating this this reality of what it is to have children who are wondrous and love science. I loved science Mm. when I was a child. It wasn't just thinking about the wonder of the skies. I did experiments. I built things. Because I was poor, I would create the tools myself. And I remembered in the seventh grade, when we're talking about hydraulics, asking a science teacher about um, the correlation between the question of pressure and what would happen in something organic such as muscles or the heart. And he asked me, what the hell do you mean? And I said, well, if you can distribute the energy in a certain way, there's going to be a conundrum when the heart pumps because it goes to capillaries, veins, and to arteries. And so when that force comes back, it has to have a way of dealing with it because it's now distributed in a way that will have to create an equilibrium back to the art. He said, what the hell are you talking about? Could you write it down? So I wrote a 40-page paper. This was in the seventh grade. And it to him. (laughs) And he said, "Uh, a few days later, it's not like that. And that was it. Years later, when I visited that school, the assistant principal said that that same science teacher had said, he thinks he has one a, a, a possible scientific genius or whiz kid in the class, but it's one of these ghetto kids, and it's, it's pointless to mentor them. Now, there was a little white kid who just simply does regular testing. And in my case, for instance, I learned, I learned mathematics on my own, self-taught. And that kid, the teachers made sure he went to summer camp for science, music, et cetera, whereas I learned music on my own and became a professional musician. I worked in mm. communities of jazz musicians, et cetera. And what I learned very quickly 
all right, is that there's a profound level of injustice in, in, in many knowledge communities because ultimately they're not interested in knowledge or learning or education. They're interested in preserving a hegemony in which only certain people get to represent knowledge, learning, etc. But in my adolescence, I was among communities of jazz musicians, and jazz musicians don't care what your race is, whatever. They just want to know you can play, whether you can smoke. <laughs> and so I got these amazing experiences of getting to be on the stage playing with Roy Eldridge or with uh, being, being in, in Harlem with, you know, people around like Billy Taylor, Frank Foster, and this entire world that was based on genuine mm. excellence. And at the same time, the mm. contradictions of New York City, because I was during the period of busing, I come out of school and seen six blocks of white people with brass knuckles and bats and everything yelling the N word to keep us out. All of those wow. things. And but in the midst of it, there were always these moments that transcend stereotypes or rigid designations of separation. So, for instance, even though I'm Jewish from Jamaica, in Jamaica, everybody around you is Jewish. It's just Jamaican and you see yourself as black people, even though my family were from people all over the world you know, all over the world, from China, from India, from Jerusalem, uh, from, um, I say Jerusalem because they left there in the 19th century. So at that time it was just Palestine, uh, from Shannon, Ireland, mm. etc. So I wasn't in an environment where I was raised with the idea of an ontological absolute difference on the basis of our phenotype or looks between me and my family members. So within that framework, one of the things that became very clear is that while we meet the rigid, there's also the fluid. And in those adolescent years, as a counter position to that horrible science teacher, was a social studies teacher who, by, and I remember her name to this day, Miss Fearman. And she said to me, there's a book you should read. And she handed me the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I have that, I have many editions, but I have the one she handed me to this day. Oh, of course, yeah. And in addition to that, my Rastafarian uncles had books by Frantz Fanon, and all, everything Black Liberation, even if they were reading it, they had it in the house. So I read them. So, and so yeah. what happens is, is it showed the power of education, of learning, and all of these people, whether it's Hal Malik Hal Shabazz, Malcolm X, or it's Frantz Fanon or Cabral or... If we're going to deal with Angela Davis, I have the autobiography of, Mal of Angela, I'm sorry, of Angela Davis, Angela Y. Davis, which is really funny because we're very good friends. So it's bizarre later in life that I'm hanging out in her kitchen and drinking wine with <laughs> this woman who, who played a central role in changing my life as an adolescent, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but the thing that became so clear is that ideas matter and People who yeah. really think reach out to others. And I give you one more mm -hmm. story and then just quickly wrap this part up. Um, th th oh, was, it's been great. Thank you. Um, there was a, an, in the ninth grade, I had a, a social studies teacher by the name of Serqua. Now, he was a gay man who, uh, today I know he was a gay man. Back then, nobody was walking around just saying, hi, I'm a gay teacher. But, but he right. re required all of us to read the New York Times every morning to discuss in class. I was poor. I couldn't afford the New York Times. <laughs> you know, even at, you know, so, you know, so I told him that and he thought I was BSing him. So he said, well, he had to travel from uh, the suburbs uh, from far Rockaway to come in. Uh, so he yeah. reads the New York Times. He read the New York Times on the train. Uh, he will, I could read his, but I'd have to come to school early to do so. So I came into school, the, I showed up, there I was, at 5.30 a.m., ready to pick up to read the New York Times. And, and I read it very quickly. And after a while, he and I began to converse. And as our conversation yeah. went on, he said, so have you ever read Hegel? Have you read Marx? I was like, who the hell are they? <laughs> and hot, Wait, I'm sorry, how old were you? At the, Ninth yeah, grade? at this point, I was just, just <laughs> heading on 14. And and so yeah, yeah. we started discussing dialectics, philosophy of history, con yeah. all kinds of concepts about what reality is. And 
God bless him. This was just a beautiful human being who just said, look, the complete opposite of that science, opposite of that science teacher. It, he, right. he saw a mind that needed to mm -hmm. be cultivated, and he did that. And I've, I've been lucky in life to have extraordinary teachers, uh, whether it's music mm. teachers, whether it's my undergraduate mentor. I studied classics with him. I also studied, mm -hmm. you know, philosophy, politics, physics, and other things, all the way through to my my uh, doctorate, where my advisor was also a man from Yiddish theater, who who was absolutely brilliant. He did philosophy and psychiatry, and studied medicine and philosophy and sociology. So mm. you could see already in this story, I was I I lived in a very relational world. But the thing that uh, I was going to say about philosophy. The way I'm talking about it, not the narrow professional um, um, crap that people do out there, which I argue is not philosophy. It's just a market commodified effort to maintain marketability in the academy. But actual philosophy, hmm. the thing about actual philosophy is the problems so move you that you don't even realize you're doing it until you have to reflect on how to give an account of what you're doing. So I did not know throughout my life, because we have a short time, I won't get into details, but that I was doing philosophy all along, all the way from being a child looking up at the sky. But the reality was that ultimately philosophy does something very beautiful. And this is, and I realized that when I was uh, in the 80s, when I was a high school teacher, secondary school teacher. I created a school called the Second Chance Program, and it was created for young people nobody wanted to teach. I was informed mm. these young people were so difficult that if 10% of them could get a high school diploma, it would be a successful program. We ended up having an 85% success rate. And when you have that, people want to know how, why. And so I wrote up a whole elaborate study, but it struck me when I was writing the study that it was something that wasn't at that time, something I had access to that I could articulate in social scientific terms. And, and what that was is why the program really worked. The reason the program really worked is because every young person who stepped into that room stepped in as a human being. And it struck me, if you were to ask any of those young people, are you a human being, they'd say, absolutely. But then it struck me, if they know they're a human being, then why is it if they're not treated like a human being, they wither? And if they're treated like a human being, they grow. It seems to me if you know you're a human being, why should that matter? And that had me interested in the question of human potential. And human potential mm. is linked to the human being's relationship to reality, but it's also linked, linked to dignity, respect, and truth. So ultimately then, this is an ongoing theme you'll find in philosophy, not only the philosophy is conventionally understood all the way back to the Greek-speaking people 2,500 years ago, where there's the famous Plato's allegory of the cave, right, where you're to get out of the cave, outside into reality, but also, rather astutely, keep going back and forth to persuade others about truth and reality. But also, uh, 2,000 years before them in East Africa, mm -hmm among ancients ranging from Hotep to Antef to Hep, um, um, Hepset to Nefertiti to Hyparcher and others also over in the Peloponnesus, what you find that connects all of them is that the moment human beings can really think and really reflect, we realize how awesome that is and how yeah. absolutely at the same time there's a responsibility that accompanies knowledge. And so for me at that moment, that is the deeper sense of philosophy. And connected to our topic today, that is also why philosophy, really being philosophy, is ultimately decolonial. Mm. Mm. So uh, first off, I mean, a lot of what you've said resonates with me. Uh, for instance, I, I'd like to loosely define philosophy just etymologically as the love of wisdom it, like it starts with that that desire that that seeking after um so that really strikes a chord with me because there are things that are done in the academy that have nothing to do really with philosophy 
right? And then there are things that in the academy that do have to do with philosophy. So it's not that it's in the academy that makes it philosophy. So that definitely, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just like walking through this. Um, really, really uh, appreciate it. As we talk about, um, uh, you know, even you're talking about the stars. I've, I, it's hard for me to explain. Like a, a lot of people have never truly seen the Milky Way. You know, like I, I lived in an hour and a half north of Green Bay in Wisconsin. So very cold. I remember it being about 30 degrees out, 40 degrees out and laying on the driveway and looking up and really seeing the Milky Way for the first time. And it's amazing how many people now miss out on that fundamental, what is really a fundamental human experience of seeing all the stars like that and what that does to you. Um, I, I know that even as you're describing your pursuit of philosophy, I mean, when I talk about chasing Leviathan, that's for me, I'm pursuing something too big to capture. And that's, that's really the whole point of this podcast. So I, again, so happy to have you on here. And it just, there's so much that you've said here that just really, really resonates with me. So thank you. Um, as we look at, uh, let's start with that decolonial uh, side of things, right? And then we can move to the aesthetics. Um, I loved what you said about uh, specifically there are different modes of knowing that are just as good as uh, explanation or philosophy. And I think that's kind of, you know, as we talk about uh, decolonizing aesthetics, that might be, uh, for me at least, that's a very interesting place to go because a lot of what I've done is trying to justify art. And then you, the more you try and justify art, the more you realize, like, why am I, why do I have to justify in the first place? So, um it, do you have any, is there, is that a path forward that you can take us? Sure. Uh, one of the things it's it's striking that you mentioned lying on your back, because the story I, I told, I was lying on my back in the grass. And a lot of people don't understand it. Standing up and, and looking at the stars is not the same thing as lying on your back and looking, you know, looking up at them. And it, and yeah. in terms of the point about, um, about, decolonization and the many other ways of, of knowing. You see, the mm -hmm. thing about it is uh, w one mistake we sometimes make there, there is that we bring to the way we analyze reality a fallacy often. And it's not that all of us do this, but many of us do this, which is we're already on the path of a colonized mentality about knowledge when we presuppose mm -hmm. certain things. And the and okay. the things are one that ultimately truth must be reductive. So we are in effect trying to squeeze something as vast as reality into a subset, which is whether it's a discipline, a method, or a language, or whatever it may be. That's already that's fallacy number one. Another fallacy mm -hmm. is the presupposition of purity. Because by definition, if you're going to purify, you're pushing so many things out. And if you purify enough, you're no longer in a relationship with anything. So ultimately, reality disappears. So that's another fallacy. The other one is related to both of those. I've noticed, for instance, that the grammar, the theological grammar of theodicy, and for listeners who are not familiar with theodicy, theodicy is when you try to account for the existence of God when there is the presence of evil or injustice. So, you know, you mm. may have had an argument with your, your parents when you were a kid and say, you know, you know, um, if God existed, why is there so much evil? And, and right. the classic response from parents is, you know, those who are God-fearing, is usually, first, who the hell are you to question God? <laughs> Yeah, And then the second one if, is, well, God is really cool. God gave you the free will. It's just that, you know, people screw it up. But if you look at the logic of both responses, they're meant to keep God intact. They're, now, that kind of reasoning we bring also to our scientists or disciplines to lots of other things. There are people who will rationalize their disciplines in such a way that they function as if they were created by God. And so if they encounter contradictions, things that don't quite work, they try to uh, disavow or to deny or degrade though the, those contradictions staring them in their face. So, and they also do it with, with countries, with states. For instance, there are people who want the United States to pretend the United States is perfect. So if you look at the miserable lives of so many people around us, 
the response is not to say, well, maybe the state isn't functioning the way it should be or the country isn't. Instead, the response is, what's wrong with those people? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. so that's that's part of it. But all of those are collected to connected to um, colonial mentalities. One of the things about colonial mentalities is that all colonial mentalities are also narcissistic. And by mm. that, they presuppose the legitimacy of self-reproduction. So it's an effort to create their image in all all across reality instead of relating to reality. It's, in other words, another version of that point I made about squeezing reality into a subset, and the subset is the self. Now, this effort, this narcissistic effort then, creates a form of uh, um, diluted imperviousness or impenetrability, which then closes off the capacity to grow, to learn. Uh, to give you an idea, when I say a philosopher, okay, a philosopher for me is a perpetual student. And in fact, when I mm. teach my classes, I also say to, to my students that they're beginning students. I'm an advanced student. But even an advanced student can learn from a beginning student because we don't have the yeah. same experiences. Someone could bring something yeah. special to it. Well, the thing about, for instance, philosophia, which translated is the love of wisdom, a lot of people don't even know that it's not historically Greek. Right, Philia is Greek, hmm. but Sophia isn't. It's from Sibet, which is in the language of Meduneter, which is an East African language that goes back an easy fifteen to twenty thousand years before Greek. And within that language, what's striking is there's so many words for wisdom, but they all are built up. Not all of them, sorry. Most of them are built up from a basic word called se, and from that you could get Sibet, say it, say it, say. I could go on and on because I could read the language. But the short version of it is it survived in many forms. It survived not only in Sophia, because the Greek-speaking people pronounced the B, F, and that's how they got Sophia. But it also survived in some of the Latin languages, like Saba in Portuguese or, and so forth. But they also had other specialized terms for knowledge and learning, like Rux, from which you get Reket, from which you get Regal, from which you get Regulate. And those are terms historically that go back to predominantly female communities, because as it turns out, mm. the earliest scientists and artists were female. 75% mm. of, for instance, Paleolithic art, art from antiquity, were by women. There's a logical reason a lot of women also develop early mathematics and science, because a lot of the, li the welfare of a community depended upon the ability to regulate knowledge all the way from a woman's menstrual cycle through to the to childbirth, through to knowing when to plant crops, which is one of the reasons why archaeologists and anthropologists have also argued that women were the inventors of farming. So when we put all this together, what we begin to realize is that there are many ways to approach reality and, and acquire or think through what we call wisdom but it's not something we possess the way we could put something in our pocket. It's something we practice through an ongoing communication that makes us continue to learn. So this then uh, becomes the ongoing way of now thinking about decolonization. But, of course, there's historical forms of colonization. For instance, the one we mostly talk about is Euro-modern colonization. But again, in order not to be reductive, the mistake that many people make is that they want to find one thing that makes it colonial. And this right. one thingness mentality, it's connected to a particular metaphysics, a, a reductive substance oriented way of looking at things, fails to understand the complexity of what the human world is. You see, the human being is an emergence. We're animals, but we are we are the animals who not who, 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 when we lay on our back, lie on our back and look, look up, up at the sky, we yeah. don't just do that. We yeah. also ask, what does this mean? And yeah. that is a, di that means we have stepped out of the realm of saturated being, of being isomorphic with simply what is, and ask mm. what is possible, what could be, what might be, or how to rethink things. So at the heart of what a human being is, is also the impetus of freedom.
Sure. So give me one second. I just wanted to ask, what what do you mean by the word isomorphic? Oh, isomorphic. Sorry um, about that. One to one. No, no, no. One to one correspondent relationship with. So if you think of yeah. a table, if your language only maps onto the table, then it's in a one to one relationship with the table. That's isomorphic. However, the example I just gave shows that if we have to create the language to put onto the table, we've already transcended the table. So, so we have. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. we have to lie to ourselves that we are at one with the table, when the truth is we have to create the language about the table. Uh, so what we're kind of talking about is uh, how a map is smaller than the world to help us better understand it. Whereas, like, for an animal, they just understand, the they just live in the world. The wor Am I tracking? You're tracking it, right. The world is there. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that the, what we can do is the end of the story. It's just part of our story. There may be way more we can do. We might even evolve, if we live long enough as a species, into creatures that can think of reality in so many ways that we cannot even imagine now. And it's that mm. creativity, right, mm. it, it is what colonialism wants to block. Because, you see, mm. if we think about colonialism as not simply the material um, conquest of people in an effort to control them, but colonialism also creates economies of control. Colonialism also creates knowledge of control. Colonialism also says that you must be in the image of those who control you. Colonialism goes on and on. But you notice every the ongoing connection is about closure. What colonialism has to convince colonized people of is the impossibility of thinking outside of the colonial structure. But, of course, both for people who participate in colonial practices and those who are subject to it, both actually know the elephant in the room, which is they both have the capacity to communicate beyond it. So hmm. when I use colonialism then, one of the, the, the best ways, if you're going to close off people's capacity for action, is to fill them with lies to the point that they will believe the lies, and so they would not even make the effort to open the door and wonder what's outside. Right. It's the, it's a situation where you could lock a person in a cell and convince the person the cell is all that reality is. So the decolonial practice is the realization that reality is not simply what we encounter. Reality also emerges from the relationship we have with it and what we produce. And the pr responsibility for what we produce, that is part of a decolonial practice. But the thing to bear in mind is when I say a decolonial practice, I don't mean it as exclusively something negative. In other words, what you're getting rid of. There's a theorist by the name of Catherine Walsh. She argues decolonial for. But in my writings, I describe also col colonial epistemologies as what I call disciplinarily decadent because they're no longer oriented to the reality. They have deluded themselves that they are reality. Whereas I argue to be released from that is, a, is to take on the willingness to go beyond our disciplines for the sake of our relationship with reality. Thus, philosophy, paradoxically, must be willing to go beyond philosophy in order to have the integrity of dealing with truth and reality. And this could take the form as, in some of my lectures, I demonstrate music. I saw that. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. poetry, uh, mm -hmm. or the very fact that the most that hum, human beings have the capacity to think philosophically without it taking the form, even when written, of a government manual. In other words, if you look at most what's called professional philosophy today, they peculiarly resemble bureaucratic manuals. And and so, if you're really thinking, right, it's not just about what you say, but there really is importance in how you say things mm. and also what's communicated at the many levels, whether they're adverbial, whether they're going to be illustrative, and more. So much that you said there, if you don't mind me just backtracking a little bit to make sure that I'm tracking with you, a uh, lot to unpack. The uh, So as an example, and obviously, when it, you know, you never want to make uh, colonization and decolonization, one thing. But when you talk about the self-reproduction, you're talking about even that uh, 18th and 19th 
uh, century desire to civilize other nations. Correct. Right. Would that be? Yes. So that would be an example. Um, and uh, I couldn't help but notice that running theme that for you, you're constantly answering the question um, uh, about how human beings evade reality. And so kind of running through everything you've just said, if I'm tracking with you, is that uh, colonization is seeking to evade reality by constructing its own facsimile, its own fake copy of reality. Correct. And in fact, and it does so in a more radical way, because you see, one of the things we have to take seriously that human beings are capable of is what the French call la mauvaise foi, which is often translated into English as bad faith. But 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 mm. it's not bad faith like the legal notion of bad faith, because in the legal notion, mm. it means you, something like signing a contract when you know you're not going to come through. OK, but that in that case, you know what you're doing. You're just lying. The thing about la mauvaise foi that's interesting, right, is that you are lying, but you're lying to yourself. The liar yes. and the lie, too, are the same. We human beings have the capacity to make ourselves believe things paradoxically that we don't believe. And the evidence can be around <laughs> us. They, you know what I'm talking about. We've seen it. Oh, I know exactly. I know. I Man, um, I personally have dealt with people who have very deep uh, trauma issues. Mm -hmm. Like, but, and to... Uh, and it's weird because you assume that something's really obvious. And then I will like uh, one of the biggest gifts my dad gave me was uh, he's like, I'd always rather over communicate than under communicate. So I was like, well, I'm just going to say the obvious thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Like they already know this. But and then to say it and watch someone who has built up and they're evading. Right. Because because of the pain and just watch their eyes glaze over and that like they can't they can't process it. I mean, that's that's a psychological and cognitive thing. But I mean, it's a I, if I understand correctly, that's what you're talking. Correct. about. And the thing that when the thing that's funny when we talk about this is that, you see, a lot of people really get pissed off if you say bad faith, because, of course, it has the word bad in it. <laughs> but they don't understand, they don't understand that um, sometimes there could be very good reasons for people to be in bad faith. So for in, in my first book, Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, I go through a really detailed analysis of the concept of bad faith. And I've done so in mm. a variety of other contexts. But, but one, the, if we think about the ways we have of evading reality, one of the ways, of course, is to disarm evidence of its force. In other words, impose upon evidence the false notion of perfect evidence. This is one of the re yes. ways in which people lie to themselves, say, about the vaccine today. Because, I mean... You know, there are physicians frustrated. There are people who have had 50 vaccines, many of which are not as, um, what's the word, as as effective as this vaccine. Yet they take the less effective stuff, but they won't take the effective stuff. But so clearly, right, they're saying unless it's one, it's absolutely foolproof, which is not what human reality is. So that's an example of how one can use, misuse yeah. evidence for bad faith. But there are others. There well, it goes back to what you said about uh, purity, right? Correct. Absolutely. You're yes. right, okay, you're sorry. right on point. And so one, there's so many ways, and I, I, we don't have time to spell out all of them, but, 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 <laughs> but, one, but one of them I would point out, which is, hmm. you know, what's interesting is when people, you can see somebody walking in bad faith. You could see it in their embodiment. When somebody has to go to a meeting they don't really want to go to, <laughs> they, they walk differently than a person who is like anxious to get to that date. You could find people who, you know, I mean, you, you, that's where we have conversations like, you're not hungry? What's wrong with your food? You know, but oh, so yeah. there's an embodiment of bad faith and what and it mm -hmm. can go in, 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 in at least two directions. One is you can try to claim that you're not your body, which is absurd because, you know, we have to be located somewhere in order for there to be a there. Or you may claim you're only your body. You have no point of view, which is also absurd, because for you even to claim it, you have to have transcended it. Now, one of the examples of where it's perfectly understandable to be in bad faith is torture. You do mm. not want to be fully embodied when somebody's torturing you. <laughs> yeah, It's yeah. a good idea to be disembodied and say, they're doing this to my body, not me. It's not true, yeah. <laughs> but it will help you survive. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Absolutely. yeah, and but where where it's so the main point is bad faith is a description that's not necessarily a moral judgment. That's the point. But because it has yeah. the word bad, a lot of people get defensive because they think it's a moral judgment to say you're in bad faith. Uh, actually, identifying someone being in bad faith is a beginning to try to uncover why. And and let's mm-hmm. face it. Once you're going to create a narcissistic image that you're civilizing the world, you need to take the position that you're good. You don't admit that actually civilization is a concept that was developed by urban dwellers to say to, 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 to separate the rural from the urban. You don't want to say things like where the moment human beings had signs, symbols and language, human beings have always had culture. You have to invent mm. crazy notions like people without culture that it, it, wherever people are, there's culture, you see. Or and, and the list just yeah, goes on yeah. and on. So that the, that helps with living with the brutality that one has unleashed on people through colonial practices. Mm. It, 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 mm-hmm. Right now, there are people who just a lot of people don't really get it. That it's part, for instance, when we talk about, say, uh, white supremacy and anti-black racism. You notice I said them as two. The reason is. White supremacy is one thing, but you could get rid of white supremacy and still have anti-black racism. You could, ju- you could, yeah, right? absolutely. So, but when you think about the combination of those things, the defensive move to say to give a critique of white supremacy is to take the position that white people must be intrinsically evil, which would of course lead to the defense of white supremacy. That's not a good route. Whereas, if hmm. one took the position to say. What's wrong with any notion of any people being put under the notion of supremacy is that it is actually a contradiction of reality. There's no such thing mm. as being superior or inferior without action, performance, etc. And even those, those are about the actions, not the people. The notion of an intrinsically superior people is oxymoronic. And similarly, the notion of an intrinsically inferior people, which is what anti-black racism is about, is also moronic. What we have to deal with is how human beings, by virtue of our imperfections, are constantly trying to find a way to, to cultivate a livable reality. So if you get back to the example I gave about earlier with bad faith, one of the things about bad faith to bear in mind, and this is a philosophical one, in order to be in bad faith, one must be free. And one of the lies we tell ourselves in bad faith is that we are not responsible for our freedom. Mm. In other words, if you are really free, you're really, really free, then you must have the capacity to attempt to evade your freedom. If you lack that capacity, then you would not be free. Am I hearing Jean Paul Sartre right now? Yes, you are. Some civil- yes, <laughs> I was like, that, that sounds familiar. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that, that was his argument in yeah. uh, Lettre de Niet, or what everybody knows as being in nothingness. His argument, mm-hmm. and this is what a lot of people miss about it. That's why he talks about evidence, criteria, all of these things, is that once we really take the position about freedom, not liberty, in the United States, for instance, in the Anglo world, people confuse liberty and freedom. They're not the same thing. Liberty just means mm-hmm. the absence of an obstacle. Freedom Mm. requires the agency of taking responsibility for whatever liberty one has in the absence of that obstacle. This this is one of the reasons I usually give this example why it's so easy for uh, the authorities to catch an escaped convict. Because when a convict escapes, right, the convict has liberty. So why doesn't the convict then just go, just keep running? But convicts eventually try to go home, <laughs> just stake out at their home. And the reason they eventually try to go home is because human beings need to have a place we belong. Mm. And part of li- In other words, livability is belonging. But to a place where you belong is not simply a physical place like a house. It's also something like a discipline. It could be your profession. It could be whatever it is that affirms your value as a human being. It could be what you're doing on a podcast. You have found something that's part of your home. And, and mm. when students discover their major, they're discovering a home. 
And right. if they and, and students who are forced into majors and in which they're not at home, we know what happens to them. It's you know they sometimes do because their parents fo- force them, etc. They don't perform well. They're alienated, etc. It's because they're not free. They're not at home. So freedom. This is this mm-hmm. is the part beyond Sartre. This is more. This is Lewis Gordon speaking. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And so that's why in my writings, freedom is also about this question of home. Now the thing is. The thing is, when you think about it, really being at home symbolically also means a place you can be in in plain language naked, right? Mm. And naked symbolically, right? You can in other words, you can say what you really believe. You don't now have to hide behind yeah. false beliefs. You can express you can you could also admit what your limitations are. But at the same time, you could also admit your strengths without being arrogant. There's a long list of wonderful things that can happen if we are able to to affirm living in 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 living freely but the thing about it is if we recoil we also can use that agency to disempower even disempower ourselves of taking that responsibility and in fact what i argue also about colonialism racism and all forms of dehumanization is that their practices of disempowerment. P- power, uh, a lot of people talk about power, but they never define it. The, the, the way I, what I mean by power is the ability to make things happen with access to the conditions of doing so. So if you have access to, for instance, we have the power to communicate because we have the access called language. Now we could use that language, the ability to communicate, to facilitate more communication. This podcast, for instance, is for people to learn something that they may find useful. And if they find it useful, they could, like those students I had in the 80s, grow. But if you Mm. and I are trying to disinform, misinform people, we could use that same ability to create practices of disempowerment, to create practices where people Mm. now begin to close in on themselves, for them to to be more invested in bad faith, to have a situation where ultimately there are policies that create not only double standards of living, but also block people's capacity to flourish. So oppression, colonization, is about the use of power for disempowerment. Liberation, freedom, is about the use of power for empowerment. But you notice as I use this, I'm talking about power the way I talk about bad faith or the way I would talk about critical good faith. I'm not using them at this stage as moral judgments, but as observations on capacities. Now, what we there are other levels in which we have to deal with their ethical and moral implications. But for now, the basic point is we have the capacity to make the world uh, better in the sense of empowerment for growth, flourishing, and also taking responsibility for everything from the climate to the question of whether we're spreading diseases to our neighbors. But we also have the power to do the opposite of those and just destroy the planet and make this conversation you and I are having the last year of human life on Earth. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. <laughs> I think there are definitely. <laughs> I think there are some moral <laughs> valuations built into that. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah. No. The um. So a couple things. Uh, one is, uh, as you were talking about, and this is a while back, but um, part of the reason that you talk about being an advanced uh, student with uh, beginner students is because philosophy should be willing to transcend itself, and it is about continually learning, whereas that, that locus of power in a teacher and an authority is like the final word is, is kind of that um, colonial mindset. Is that – am I tracking there? Yes, you are. In fact, this is okay. why, for me, great exemplars of philosophy are people mm. like Antef, Hypatia, Socrates, all the way through to people such as Franz Fanon, Malcolm X, or Jean-Paul Sartre, or John Dewey, or Simone Weil, or Simone de Beauvoir, or Angela Davis. Mm. Because, mm. But since a lot of people, because this context is philosophy, immediately would think of Socrates, one of the things about Socrates is he always wanted to learn. Yeah. He was never didactic or condescending. He walked the streets. 
he would speak with people, and he always, he always, he had a profound faith in his fellow human beings' capacity to teach him something and, hmm. and to learn from them. And Antef says the same thing. There's a letter from Antef. Uh, he was, a, it was an ancient Kemetin. Uh, uh, that, that country was subsequently um, colonized by uh, Persians and then Macedonians and was renamed Egypt. But its ancient name was Kemet. And he has hmm. a letter in which he spells out that what a philosopher is. And he points out that a philosopher is somebody who really profoundly wants to learn, but also is overjoyed in others' learning. In other words, mm. it's about learning together. And if you think about it, you know, one of the treacheries imposed upon philosophy is to treat philosophy like warfare. You mm. come into a fight, yes. you knock down the other's argument, you defend your argument, blah, blah, blah. The problem with that is, in a nutshell, you can win a fight but be wrong. <laughs> it's true for marriage, Correct. too. Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you look at it as a communicative practice of learning together, it means you're always accountable. You always, hmm. people, in other words, ultimately the evidence has to be such that all who are communicating are able to see it. And this is shared across I philosophies from east to west, north to south, different ages. And that connects to another question I wanted to ask, um, or more as an example. You know, you mentioned it in terms of racism, but uh, I see this all the time. Uh, when we evaluate, evaluating actions over evaluating people and the way that we act in bad faith by evaluating people instead of actions. So, for instance, uh, in order to protect ourselves, we say things like, He's such a good man. I don't see how he could have done that. Oh yeah. Or he's such a he's such a bad like they're oh they're a terrible person. Could they really do something good? And it's like good good men do bad things all the time, and bad men do good things all the time. And it's our way of organizing the world into uh, into camps and to protect ourselves. Yeah. Is no, that you you. It's a great example you're, you're making. Yeah. What that does, of course, is to ignore evidence. And the thing about evidence is evidence has to be evidential. Excuse me. <clears throat> and by evidential, what I mean is that it must appear. Evidence, by definition, mm. is social. The idea that there's evidence that absolutely only you can see, that's problematic. And even when you are the person who's processing it, say, first, you're processing it paradoxically outside yourself. In other words, what you're realizing is what another person should be able to see. Evidence is yes. always social. Yes, and, and that's something, uh, so there's an interesting uh, connection here between what you've talked about with evidence and with freedom, is that in both cases, you're talking in a communal and social context. Yeah, uh, And maybe I'm reading too much into that. When you talk about freedom, you, freedom's ultimately about belonging. And so freedom really doesn't exist outside of uh, your, the, your community. Absolutely correct. Uh, you know, when you talk about... Belief. No, you got yeah. the nail on the head. You can have liberty in isolation. Uh, you could go out in the woods and build yourself a cabin and say you're all that. And everything is just a matter of whether, whether, they're, whether a landslide locks you in or not. But that's not freedom. Yeah. That's liberty, but yeah. it's not freedom. That ultimately, freedom is always connected to others. There's always an accountability with freedom. Is there a connection between evidence always needing to be social and freedom being social? Yes. Yes, there, yes, yes, there is. Because ultimately, even if you go to the log cabin example, there's no accident why many people in those situations begin to create echoes of a broader social world. They mm. begin to create things that could communicate. It's like that wonderful movie that Tom Hanks was in when he was on the isolated island. Why did he have to create Wilson? It was my first thought. As soon as you said echoes, I was thinking, I thought of Wilson. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 that's exactly <laughs> it. You see, part of language and part of sociality, even when we are physically alone, we talk to ourselves. Even though we're not outright mm. saying words, in our head, we are thinking ideas and so forth. And that is something rather profound because, you see, from an external point of view, there's just physical stuff there. But the ongoing production of meaning, that, you know, that's where... A lot of the action is.
Because mm. at, at a basic biomass level, you and I are absolutely no different than any any group of human beings that preceded us thousands of years ago. But we live in a world of constellations of meanings that are mind-boggling, and mm. and there could be subsequent generations that could wow us to come. And part of that is because reality for us doesn't stop at our fingertips and at our eyes and our feet and our nose. Reality also, and this is a, a rather technical term, reality for us is also subjunctive. And by subjunctive, it's, if you think in grammar, it's, when, it's the difference between we say um, what there is and what there would, could, or should be. And mm -hmm. our ability to deal with the subjunctive is amazing. What, yeah. Why? It means, for instance, you and I just had a conversation that actually was dealing with ideas uh, that were put on the table by people that go back from about 4,000 years ago. And mm -hmm. if this, the radio signal from this conversation reaches some other, you know, galaxy and it's able to be deciphered, somebody could say, whatever mm -hmm. they talk about, and then say, <laughs> and then enter that conversation, even though we'd be long dead and gone. That mm. is extraordinary. And that is what reality is about. Reality is not simply about a reduction to being, like a thing that you can hold in your hand. Those are parts mm. of reality. But the greater picture is going to be around these complex ways in which we can produce what is real through what is meaningful and what is true. Dr. Gordon, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Uh, didn't get to the aesthetics part. That's fine. This conversation has been fantastic. Um, well, if you'd like me to, did want to if end... you'd like me to come back, I'd Go gladly have one where we just devote to the aesthetic part in the future. Oh, that would be good. Uh, that would be great. I would love that. The, um, you mentioned the constellations of meaning, and one of the questions I definitely wanted to touch base as we kind of wrap up here is how can we go back to uh, – how can we reclaim our history and not cut ourselves off from those constellations of meaning without um, uh, without bringing the colonization into it? How can we decolonize the past in ways that allows us to move forward? The short answer, because we have limited time, is to ask <laughs> the right questions. You notice how differently mm. you think of a classroom situation when I think of the professor not as Moses with the tablets, but as a person in a conversation in an ongoing practice of learning. It means mm. now we begin to, to think of the past in different ways. And I just give you a good example. I already said that one has to uh, make people believe in their incapacity uh, their, in, their inability to be able to do anything about reality in order to colonize them. Well, among those mm. has been the false story. I'll just pick slavery as an example because we're in the U.S. context. The standard story brought to many people is that enslaved people were just brute labor brought over to just function like machines. That's Well, if we ask the right questions, we realize that that doesn't make any sense for a variety of reasons. First, mm. one would have to know about what Africa was. Africa was a place of not only states. It had doctors. It had lawyers. It had teachers. It had people uh, who could do all kinds of... In other words, the enslaved people had skills. And if you think about mm. any way they're skilled labor, if it, whether it's from recent immigrants, any way you think about it, skilled labor bring their skills. The places that yeah. had those African skills, because... A lot of the Americas is uh, a lot of a lot of these. This part of the world is more like Africa than than Europe, and a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, for instance, if you are in uh, northern Europe, uh, because of the waters from the Gulf Stream, there's greater um, precipitation, and so there are ways in which farming was developed in those areas that was very different from what happens in places with droughts. And so there are a lot of skill sets that were brought by those enslaved people. And what it turned out was that the plantations that had enslaved people directly from Africa tended to prosper because of the technologies Africans brought along with them. 
So I usually illustrate it this way to my students. Here's what your morning would look like if you took black people out of American history. Uh, you wouldn't have been able to turn on your light this morning because the filament was developed by an African-American, not Thomas Edison. He was the person who owned the company. You wouldn't have your cotton shirt the way you, you, know, you know it because the cotton gin wasn't developed by Eli Whitney. It was by an enslaved person, Sam. It's just the enslaved mm. person. Enslaved people couldn't own patents. So the enslavers, right? and I, I would go through a long list. You couldn't use the toilet, invented by a black person. The doorknob, the stoplight, it keeps going. That's not that white people didn't invent things. The point is that people invent things. But but mm. this, this weird dichotomy of passive brute labor versus thinking active owners of labor, we got to get rid of that. And once we begin to understand that, now we begin to understand our intersubjective relationship to the past. We begin to ask, what would I do in that situation? It's important to learn that the people fought. You know, what changed the Civil War wasn't that there were white soldiers in the North fighting Confederates in the South and they just won. The South almost won the war. What made the what kept the Union together were 250,000 black soldiers entering the war and kicking the butt of the South. And so, again, you think of your history differently if you think of yourself as passive instead of active. And, and among those soldiers were women. There were black women and men out there doing these things. So in a lot of history, even the conversation you and I had about women scientists in the past, we don't even have to get into race with this. Think about what we do to women when we when yeah. we rewrite the history where so many women in history are rewritten as men. The very fact that you and I are speaking mm. on computers, the algorithm for the computer was written by Ada, Ada Lovelace, the daughter of Lord mm -hmm. Byron. When we go through mm -hmm. thinking about the wireless technology we use, we need to think of Hadi Lamar, a Jewish act, a female you know actress, uh, you're right, an actress who you know, was busy looking pretty on the screen to many people, but she was actually one of the U.S.'s greatest weapons. She was actually part of the technology team to really, you oh. know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the, so the main point is we need to think outside of the box. We need not to be afraid mm -hmm. of the truth. And we need to remember mm -hmm. we're studying human beings. And human beings not only have great triumphs, creative ideas, but human beings also do some <clears throat> effed up stuff. And 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 and, yep. and we got to get rid of holier than thou, <laughs> and we got to get into yeah. an understanding of what it is to understand that what it is to be in it together, and to try to our best to build a better world. You know, there's no other way I could I would rather end this podcast than with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much, and to all the listeners, continue being safe and healthy, and do find moments of joy. They'll remind you of your humanity. Thank you. Bye.